Welcome to another episode of the Mind Man Podcast with your host today and every day, Adrian Moreno. The word excited really does not do it any justice when I say I am very excited to bring to you guys this episode today. Today I have the great honor and pleasure of interviewing entrepreneur, author, COO, and co-founder of a heart-driven of a heart-driven digital agency, Magic, Gareth. Herman. Gareth is not your typical entrepreneur, choosing alignment over hustle and spirit over material and inclusion over exclusion. And that's exactly why I feel like success found him with absolutely no trouble. I mean, within only two years, now trust me, he's not an overnight success. He's been doing this for a while. But within only two years, he went from being a broke solopreneur to leading a 20-person, seven-figure business. And he went from living in a tool shed to a 6,500-square-foot mansion. Now, he also does run a second business named Exponential. It's a team where they take your vision, and they take a specific goal, and they put you on a team of people who are going to hold you strongly accountable to make sure that it happens. It's basically like a, like a high level of accountability, which a lot of us need at times. Now, he is really a phenomenal human being, and you're going to see that very quickly when you listen to this episode, who not only believes in a greater vision for the future, but he has the guts to actually follow through with creating just that. And after reading his book, How to Create the Greatest Civilization That Has Ever Existed, I have to admit I'm fully convinced that this guy will move mankind forward. He is, I mean, he's basically already doing it. And I'm more than happy to join him in bringing on this new reality that already feels like it's truly making its presence known. Now, don't just listen to what he says with your ears, but fill it with every ounce of you, the physical and the non-physical of what you are. Gary's uncle once told him, not every conversation will change someone's life, but each conversation has the potential to. And don't take it lightly when I say this just might be that conversation. day everybody good morning good afternoon good evening whenever you're listening to this i just want to say once again thank you so much for joining another pod another episode of the mind man podcast and today i am extremely pleased and like i said in the intro you know the word excited truly doesn't do me any justice when i say that i am beyond excited to be um interviewing you know of such a great human being today and it's, it's really cool the way we met, actually. Um, so I like really wouldn't know of this guy at all if it wasn't for the coaching program I'm in. And so I want to give you guys a little background on how we met. So I am in a coaching program. Um, of, I have a business mentor. And every week we do like these mindset calls. And then one day um, on a mindset Monday, they had Gareth come in. And after hearing what this guy said and then Googling his name and just looking into his website, I instantly knew, okay, this guy has to be on the podcast because he has such a powerful mind. So, brother, I just want to, again, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time out of your uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to really do this, not just for me or for yourself, but for the world, because um, this conversation, I have a strong feeling it's going to be a very powerful one. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Looking Ab- forward to this conversation. Yes, absolutely, brother. Absolutely. I am beyond excited. So um, let's go ahead and let's just get right into it, man. So first and foremost, I, I want, you know, I want the people to get, I want you to like introduce yourself to to, to this world and, um, you know, tell us your story. You know, who are you? You know, where do you come from? And basically, what do you do? And what led you to like, do you know, having the business that you're building now? Yeah, so the story starts in a uh, small rural farm in the middle of nowhere in Portugal. So uh, my parents were interesting human beings. And uh, they actually met on a plane to India to see the same guru, go see the same guru. So oh, wow. I had a very... Had a very interesting upbringing and uh, started off living in a 
uh, in a one room house in, in Southern Portugal. And I grew up on a farm there with, you know, you think about all the technology we have today. All we had was like wooden toys and like a bicycle and a farm. So that's how I grew up. And when I moved to the States, it was quite shocking to get into uh, Sega Genesis and, you know, uh, <laughs> and uh, what else is happening? Yeah, like baggy clothes and whatever was going on in the 90s. So, yeah, it was a little bit challenging for me to feel like I was part of the system or this society, which, which led me to have a very interesting perspective of feeling like the outsider and being able to observe the way things are and just see problems and opportunities and just how things worked. Um, I was always fascinated. Like when I was a kid, I was always taking apart anything that would come through the front door. Like I was reading the instruction manual for like the vacuum cleaner and like trying to like take apart the microwave. And we got our computer understanding that. And the reason I mentioned that is because that's, that's kind of my, how I started to approach business later in life then is really from this lens and perspective of really looking to understand how does this all work and coming at it from a beginner's mindset and also from a more objective view of less so of being in it. And uh, yeah, when, you know, we didn't have a lot. So when, when we were in the States, I started working when I was 14 and by the time I was 17, I started my first business. So my dad was doing interior, exterior painting, painting houses, and I just learned how to do that from him. But there's a certain point where he got super busy and didn't want all the jobs, and so I started taking them. And then I got too busy, because I was just working on weekends, you know, and going to high school at the same time. And so then I started to hire my friends to work for me. Wait, so you were in high school and you had, you had like a full-on business and you were hiring friends while you were in high school? Yeah, exactly. Like everyone else had their parents, you know, uh, some money from their parents and whatever. But I, I, I was just making my own money. Like I wanted to go to the movies. I had to go, you know, go make the money to do that. Um, and yeah, it was pretty cool because by the time I was 18, I was able to have leverage and decision making power in my life. For example, I really wanted to buy a motorcycle and my mom was against that, obviously, uh, but I wanted to get one. So I got one because I was 18 and I had the money. You had the money. And yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was really great. And um, I, you know, I just learned a lot about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. For example, I already knew that I was not good at sales. I did not like doing negotiations over price. It made me extremely anxious and nervous to be talking about money and sales. But uh, yeah, at the, at the same time, it was just, you know, it just felt good to like get paid in cash, have stacks of cash and, um, you know, be, be making my own money. And, and I, you know, put myself through college. So yeah, I've always kind of had my own business and going through college was kind of weird because then I had to start out at the bottom of, of the totem pole again. I got like an internship out of college and I was like, hey, you guys are running this organization completely wrong. Uh, you know, like you guys should be doing this, that, and that. But they're like, who's this guy? He's like 22 years, two years old. He's trying to tell us how to run this thing. Like, no, you're the, like, go write that one report. And it, it was just really a frustrating experience for me uh, that made me realize that, yeah, I just, yeah, it, it was just hard to kind of get back into trying to climb some ladder when I felt like I had my own worldview and my own skills that weren't being valued. Oh, yeah, I can imagine so, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and then things evolved, you know, I started, uh, tried another business after that and that failed. And, you know, I, I went through essentially two, two startups and like a, a personal coaching business that I either unsuccessfully, you know, managed or made it, made too many mistakes and, and, and really just learned a lot and ended up just losing all my money on multiple ventures, multiple wow. times before getting to magic with that, you know, the business that I have now, which has been really taking off. So by no means has it been an over my overnight success. You know, I'm 30 years old now and I've been on the entrepreneurial since I've journey since I've been 17. And oh, wow. yeah, it has been quite, quite a roller coaster. No. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. So let's actually, let's talk about that. Let's talk about your, your, your agency magic, because after going through, you know, like the website, looking at what y'all guys do and like what, I realized like, this really is not a typical digital agency by any means. I'm like, this company, they work with a specific kind of group. Not, they're not just out there for everybody to work with. So I would like to know, like, you know, 
basically how did this conscious driven agency begin? Like where did it all begin? Yeah. So my business partner and I, Marcus, when we started this business, I mean, we, it was really a side hustle for both of us. You know, we both, I had, I was working on a startup and I was just doing coaching for cash flow. Marcus was the marketing director for a solar company and we just wanted to make some more money. Our Marcus wanted to make additional cash. I just wanted to make some more money to help the startup. Unfortunately, we decided to close down the startup. So what I noticed in the space was that digital marketing, it's a unique field because your age is a liability versus an asset. You know, if you go into any other industry, everyone looks at your age and judges you based on your experience. Digital marketing, the reverse is true. They automatically assume the younger you are, the better you are at social media. So it was an industry where we felt like that we could immediately get in the game and be seen as credible and, and, and play a big game. Then in addition to that, it has massive influence. So if you think about it, on average, I mean, you, know, you could probably reach a thousand people for $5 using social media advertising, which is an insane amount of influence. If you think about, you can literally start sending people messages for so cheap that you can, especially if you're running something like a presidential campaign, which we have at Magic, you can influence so many people for so little money. It's almost like a revolution in advertising has occurred. You know, in the past, we wanted to be Coca-Cola, getting the Super Bowl ad, and, you know, try, trying to go that, like the mass market. The game has changed. Now it's all about the niche market and targeting your very specific audience online. And it's much more, it's, it's so much more cost effective to do that. So when we were, when we were doing these projects, we would find so many nasty people in this industry though. There was straight up people that would sell anything from like porn to whatever, just to make money and to oh. get sales. And, and we just, we didn't like that. And there's all these bros too, that were just super into fantasy football and flat rims and beers and weed. And just like, it was like college 2.0. And what we, we discovered is that there's some really amazing businesses in the world that need, that need digital marketing support. And they didn't want to work with the bros. They didn't want to work with the sketchy people. And so that's what we decided to go with magic. It was to really focus in on conscious businesses that want to make the world a better place and eco-friendly businesses, but essentially people that care more than just generating a profit. They care about their people. They care about the world. They care about making a difference. And, and that is the niche that we decided to focus our agency on and the customer segment that we wanted to go after. Wow, I like that. That's because I feel like a lot of digital agencies are kind of like, yeah, you know, we cost this much. Yeah, to come over, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get your business off. So y'all don't have a problem with saying no. And I like that. that that's, that's really, really awesome. And just the fact that you support, you know, um, I can see that with the mission you're on, it's clear that you're, you know, you're trying to elevate, you know, the collective consciousness of the world because you're focused on growing those particular companies like mine. You know, mine would be a, perfect fit because um i have a fitness i have a fitness business but i try i or i i don't i don't want to say i try because i have already completely merged it in with uh spirituality and it's about making people not just healthy but conscious and so i that's my that's definitely my goal you know it's to you know i know we're you know who knows if we're going to be able to make the world conscious in our lifetime but i'm okay with dying a failure um, as long as I, you know, um, die trying and doing what I'm, you know, meant to do. So I, that brings me to a next question is, in your opinion, what do you think the world needs the most right now? Like when you look around and you like looking around to see what needs to be done or what, what's needed, what would you say that is? I think it goes back to the core purpose of magic, which is to elevate human consciousness from, from a systems thinking perspective. So in college, I studied integrated science and technology. And so we looked at engineering, manufacturing, environment, energy, uh, telecommunications, computer programming, it was really a systems oriented view of the world and how to solve problems. And what I see is that we're almost, we, are you familiar with integral theory? Have you ever heard of integral theory? No. It's a, it's a theory. So it's, it's, it's all about how humans evolve in consciousness, but not just so from like a, a personal level, but as a group level. And so what we're seeing is that the world 
humans have evolved, you know, from hunter gatherers to organizations that like a civilization that actually has hierarchy and structure. Like if you can think about the caste system in India, you know, that had a lot of hierarchy and structure and that allowed it to create large cities. However, that's, you know, after that stage of evolution, we moved to more of like capitalism where it was less about your social class and anyone with a great idea could innovate and become great. And, and we, and we can see that, that I feel like that those kind of two mindsets are still ruling the world where it's all about either, you know, who you were, what family you were born into and your social hierarchy, or it's about being, you know, the innovative, cool entrepreneur or game changer or someone like Gandhi who has a cool idea and, and just changes everything. And, and when I, what I, what I see the world needs most is that next up level in group consciousness so that we go to a more uh, community and, and world and, and worldview focus. So it's not just about individual achievement, pursuit of success. It's not just about furthering your own family or, you know, keeping up your family traditions or name. The next evolution that I really feel like we really need is for people to understand that we're all in this together and that my actions impact the other that the other's impactions impact the world and to actually care about that and to be able to care for more than, than just yourself. So it's really a problem, I would say in consciousness and, and we need that next evolutionary step because as Einstein famously said, our, you know, our, our problems can't be solved at the same level of consciousness that created them. If you look at our education system, that is absolutely like a caste hierarchical system. You know, it's, it's like, that's why people have such a tough time in it because it's dehumanizing to go to high school, right? It's, 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 uh, if you think about why airports suck, it's the same reason. It's so hierarchical. Like you talk to this person like, Hey, can you help me out with my ticket? They're like, sorry, it's like not my job. I'm just playing this one role. And so you, that's like, that's, if you think about what an airport experience might be like, or a high school experience might be like, if those humans in that system had the mindset of, you know, caring for self, caring for others, being able to innovate, have responsibility, agency, and, and really, you know, have, have the autonomy and, 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 and the mental and emotional power to, to see all of the impacts and make powerful decisions. It'd be a completely different world. Wow. Okay. So that, you know, that brings me to like the next question. And so in your book, how to create the greatest civilization that ever existed. By the way, that was, I mean, I I know it was a very short book, but it was astonishing how much impact a book can have. Uh, that small of a book, because like as a business owner, it, it, it makes you think completely differently about business. I'm not going to lie. So one of the things that really, really caught my eye was, you know, um, you stated that something, a new paradigm is like emerging and it is conscious capitalism. Can you explain what conscious capitalism, like, like what, what that is? Yeah, so if you think about, I think one of the, the key fundamental principles of capitalism is that if you own something, you're going to take care of it. So the, the whole capitalist paradigm is based off of ownership. It's about who owns what. And then it's an exchange of goods uh, based on value or perceived value. And, and, and But it, the, one of the core principles is owner it ownership. So when I, when I think about conscious capitalism, by the way, if you're interested in that, there's a whole conscious capitalism movement in the United States. Uh, you can check it out. There's chapter chapters in pretty much every state. Oh yeah. So, so there's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a movement for me personally. What I, when I think about conscious capitalism is to, to take that ownership responsibility more in the light of stewardship than it's all about me and, and I own it. It's, it's more so I'm stewarding wealth, I'm stewarding assets, I'm stewarding you know, this company, I'm stewarding these people that are part of the company. And again, and then doing that from a place of care of more than just the bottom line. It's caring about people, it's caring about the planet, it's, it's caring about business. So that's, that's what they call a triple bottom line. And that's my definition of conscious capitalism. Wow, I like that. Yeah, I'm definitely down with that paradigm for sure. For sure, it definitely sounds like you know something more. I mean, just much more inclusive. You know, I feel like this world is like you know, this, especially when it comes to business, it's like it's kind of like a, a like an exclusive approach. You know, like what what can I get? And so, I'm not gonna lie. You know, like I went through that phase where the money grew initially, 
And I went from, you know, being like, oh, okay, what can I do next to close this person? And that was like, you know, the mindset that I saw myself picking up. And I realized, like, you're not in this for you, bro. I was like, whenever I saw, whenever I switched that mindset to what can I do next to help this person, business started soaring. And that's when I realized, like, when you, when you just run things and like, I mean, when you just look at the world with an inclusive view, I feel like things kind of fall into place, you know, a bit more faster for you than if you're, you know, going at it with the old approach that we do. And so that's what, that's kind of what, you know, because I, I thought you became successful like that after I read that thing. But after hearing you elaborate today, saying like, you know, you've been an entrepreneur. So like, You know, you've been an entrepreneur. It's not like you just got successful overnight. But I feel like this magic agency, like, I feel like this grew pretty quickly for you. Um, You know, like you said, you went from zero to seven figures and, you know, in in, in a year. And that is like, and that's, that to me is mind blowing. So I want to know, what do you think was responsible for that? Like, what do you think your unique skill or quality was? That wasn't only responsible for your, you know, your success, but the time that it took to, you know, hardly become this successful with your agency. Like, what do you think it was about the agency and about the way you approached it that made it take off like this? Well, I think that's often a, like there is no such thing as overnight success. I mean, I personally believe, I mean, you know what overnight success is? Me and one of my housemates used to joke about this. Overnight success is when you spend like years staying up all night working and then, you know, one day it clicks and then it's like, oh, overnight success, you know? Yeah, that's right. I did build that success overnight uh, because I had multiple things going on for years. You know, that's, Mm. that's my perspective on it. So yeah, I don't know why America is so obsessed with like overnight success and things happening quickly. But from my experience, what, you know, the, the way that, the way that, uh, that it works is that you, you build up experience amount over time. And the more experience you have, like the more, the quicker you get at doing things, and the more synergy and alignment that you have. So it's, it's more so all the mistakes I made with my first, you know, painting business, all the mistakes I made in the kombucha business, all the mistakes I did in the business accelerator business, you know, it's just all that stuff. You learn how to do things wrong. So when we started off magic, it was nice because you kind of have a clean slate to do things right. And all of the things that, you know, there's a lot of different facets to business. You have finance, you have sales, marketing, operations, you know, supply chain, you got, uh, you know, customer success, uh, you got, you have your HR department. So there's, there's so many pieces of the wheel to get enough understanding of how all of them work. That's what I was doing in my 20s. So when we started Magic, I knew how to do the how to start something right. It's imagine that you a lot of business owners they start building a building, they screw up the foundation, and then they're trying to put on the third story or the roof, and they're still dealing with the impacts of having the foundation wrong. So that was the beautiful thing about Magic is that we were building a new building, and from the first day we did it right. You know, like I said, we talked about our purpose. We did this whole team formation process in the first month about, you know, what is our purpose? What are our values? We created the cultural foundation. You know, we decided on who our target market was and niched down super hard, which is a little mistake a lot of business owners make. It's they new people in service-based businesses. They say, everyone's my client. I can help anyone. And mm-hmm. and the more you oh, niche down. Real yeah. quick. Yeah. So once you niche down, it's a lot easier to get that initial traction, right? Our website galvanizes people. Some, some people love us. We literally have hopped on sales calls before and people have been like, ah, you know, we checked out your website before the call and we're, we're concerned, right? At the same time, other people say like, oh my God, we just checked out your website. We can't wait to talk to you guys. We've been waiting for you. Like, I'm so grateful you exist. And so we've had very polarizing, uh, you know, messaging and marketing because we so clearly take a stand for what we believe in and who we want to serve and how we serve them. And so that, that kind of clarity has, has allowed us to take off uh, as we have. Because if you're, your, if you're our target audience, you for sure want to work with us. If you're not, if you're going to be judgmental of who we are. And that polarizing marketing and messaging, uh, along with the business clarity, is I think why we've taken off so fast. Yeah, and I definitely used to be, um, 
real. I was that kind of person. I was like, man, like, should I post this? Like, what are people going to think about it if I post this? I know some people are not going to like this. And then my mentor, Sturdy, was like, no, like, you just have to be polarizing. He goes, because you're going to see which people you don't want to work with and you're going to see your audience right there, the people who are supporting that. And once I started doing that, like, things definitely took off very quickly. And I, so I can definitely, um, it's like, it's like if you have, if you have a, a big net, you know what I mean? People are like, oh, I don't want to just work with one specific person because I feel like, I feel like I'm missing out on so much. Well, think about it. If you had like a big net and you threw it in the ocean, you know, you don't want big holes. You're going to lose a lot of fish. You want the smaller hose, so you catch a lot more. And so that's what I really like about that polarizing approach. That's awesome. So you were talking about... There's there's another piece of the puzzle, just building off of your fish metaphor. It's Uh a common metaphor that's used. And another thing that we did really well early on was establish a lot of strategic partnerships with investment firms and also with entrepreneurship communities that gathered our target audience. And... So the the metaphor there, going back to the fish metaphor, your strategic partnerships or channel marketing is similar to instead of trying to catch the fish yourself, you're building relationships with fishermen that every once a week or once a month hand you bags of fish. So we we hit that really strong in the the first years. We just opened up two very significant channel partners that brought us a ton of business. And that, that really helped skyrocket our growth as well. Mm, I like that. I like that a lot. That's a, Oh, that's a real good one. Okay. So now let me, let me ask you this. Um, we were talking about success. So that brings me to a question saying, you know, the idea of success, you know, just the idea of success alone. I feel like the energy around the word success, it, I feel, I don't know how to say it. I feel like it makes people believe that becoming successful is hard or like just damn near impossible. Like, I know that's the way I saw it. And I also used to see success as a greedy thing to do. I was like, me becoming successful, that's kind of selfish. Like, that's greedy. Why do you think we have that perception around success? I, I, I like to blame it all on the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like if you think about what's in the media and the news and in TVs and in TV shows and in rap songs and music videos, it's, it's just spinning up this narrative that it's culture. You know, it's this whole, um, I mean, I'm not like an anthrop- anthropologist, but if you think about what happened in the 50s and World War II and coming out of that and really wanting to create a home and family, it was all about career and social status and getting a nice home. And that was the most important thing for people. And I imagine rightfully so, you know, that kind of culture evolved because for my understanding, there was a lot of poor immigrants that came over here from Europe in the early 1900s and war was tough. So yeah, I think that it's just, again, a natural evolution. Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's this foundational uh, need that you have for, you know, safety, security, shelter, food, and, and then, and that's the foundation. So that's a huge driver, right? And then you have the emotional layer on top of that next in Maslow's hierarchy, which is uh, you know, connection to a social group and status and well-being. And, and then above that, you have self, you know, you have more uh, the self-actualization piece. So I think that a lot of success kind of got stuck in the bottom there where it's about achieving material success, mm-hmm. which, which, is, which is really important, right? Because, you know, I'm having this, we're having this conversation from a place of privilege, be able to self-reflect and say like, hey, isn't there more to life than just, you know, achieving these certain check boxes. So that, I think it's a necessary piece of evolution to define success as having material success. However, then we have the opportunity to self-reflect and say, what is this really all about? And where do we get meaning? Where do we get fulfillment? And, and where do, you know, what is actually important to us? And in my book, Great, How to Create the Greatest Civilization Ever, I really encourage everyone to redefine success for themselves, right? Because if you imagine, you know, if you even think about how you think about success, I guarantee you it's because of the, you know, your peer group, what they believe is successful, maybe your parents, how they define success or the culture you grew up in. And that's why I'm a little bit different because I grew up in multiple countries, multiple countries. I had interesting parents with interesting worldviews. And so I, I just have a little bit of different metric for what success is for myself. And I truly desire that for everyone 
so that they're living their lives and they're not living you know, the life of someone they see or follow on Instagram because they think that's cool or they're not stuck in a job because their parents, you know, wanted them to, to be that or, you know, that's what they, they thought would give them love or a beautiful relationship or, you know, fulfillment and connection. And that's, that's usually the trap of entrepreneurship. Most entrepreneurs I know either have, you know, a deep seated, seated like fear of something bad going to happen or scarcity, or they have significant lack of self-worth where it's like, Hey, I'm the, my, how loved I am or how much I'm worth in anything is equated to what I can produce or do, or, you know, I'm, I'm never going to feel safe or okay unless I have this like huge financial resource or foundation. So there's uh, most people have definitely have like a negative, uh, or a, uh, yeah, or, or maybe more so a, a, uh, maybe a, a more shadow motivation coming out of the gate. And then through time that gets to evolve and change and more. And so, yeah, it's a conversation to be in. What does success mean to you? And what, how do you define it? Well, what, what, is, what does success mean to you? I want to know what, what your perception of success is, your personal perception. Well, where I'm at right now is that I'm finding that, I, I, you know, I had a really beautiful life in Portugal as a kid. And anytime I travel to third world countries or developing nations, there's a piece of humanity there that's missing from the first world in the United States. So I don't know if you've ever been to, the, let's say, Haiti or somewhere in Africa or uh, places yeah, of India. Yeah. yeah. So if you go to there, you'll see that people are so rich in humanity and fulfillment and connection. And so something that's something that I'm trying to engineer into my life in Boulder right now is more vulnerability, more authenticity, more heart connection on a consistent basis because there's a huge, I feel like the number one disconnect in America right now or, or, or shadow or challenge is that of isolation and loneliness. You know, we all live in boxes and we communicate through boxes and we're just <laughs> driving around and it's, I got to, you know, I hang out with a friend. I got to schedule it for next week or two weeks out. And so there's no flow. There's no consistency and intimacy and connection on a regular basis. If you compare that to living in a, in a village environment, where you're literally walking down the same street every day, talking to the same people and you're like living on top of everyone. And there's, I think that's the number one thing that I'm defining for success right now is how connected do I feel? And, and, and taking a look at that and seeing what I can do to have more connection in my life. Yeah. I feel the same exact way. Like for me, um, success comes down to how am I feeling? It's not about, you know, what the bank balance is looking like. It's like how, how connected am I feeling with everything around me? Because like when you feel connected, you can tell, you know, it's like a completely different feeling. And um, being able to wake up joyful and fall asleep the exact same way, because I know a lot of people can't do that. That has always been success in my eyes. I'm just like, how joyful can I really live this life? Instead of working hard, can I work joyfully instead of working hard? And then when I work joyfully, I find myself working, working hours that people say, oh, man, you're working really hard. But to me, it's like, you know, I'm, it's, it's like I, I'm not goal, put it this way. I'm not goal-oriented. I definitely have goals, but I'm more like life-oriented. Like what, you know, it's not about the it's not about the mango. It's about the process of you know getting the mango, and as long as I can enjoy that, I know I'm gonna get where I want to go. But I want the ride to be joyful, and um, that's really what I'm about. Is just pleasantness, man. It's just joy, and and I like how you really said, you know, it's not, it's 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 not your idea of success because a lot of people I don't think they notice that. Like a lot of the times in you know, one of the podcasts that I just recorded actually was talking about, you know, it's your beliefs. They're not even your beliefs. You know, they're just somebody else's that they put into you. And so here we are. You're literally living up to somebody else's idea, even if it feels just wrong in your heart. What's the point of doing that if you're, you know, if so people got to understand this is their life and their reality. So what do they want to live up to, to what they feel is right in their heart? 
And so I I love that you have that perception because like it definitely I, I feel like we have the same um, view on that. Now a question about your book, you know, the greatest civilization. What does the greatest civilization that ever existed look like to you? Like, what does that civilization have that our current one doesn't? I think the, you know, for, for example, my role in this is less so to be the visionary of how it looks and more so the person that brings the leaders together and supports them in taking massive action on that because that's, that's really my zone of genius. I, I believe that there's actually people out there that might have a cooler vision of the greatest civilization ever, um, that, or they might have a clearer or better vision. That's their skill set, And it's more so my role to help build it and to get the right people on the bus with the right organizational structures to take massive action and make it happen. But I do feel like there's a, I mean, at least for me, I desire to have a couple foundational building blocks in the greatest civilization ever that are radically different from how we do things now. And the number one thing is it kind of starts tying into the previous conversations we've had in this podcast. The number one thing is, is a design perspective that takes into consideration humans and, and the natural world and really thinking about optimizing for the ecosystem success of humans, Ooh. natural world, and really thinking about you know, how can we make that the outcome success? How can we make thrive, like a thriving planet the point of civilization? And I think if we start to orient our, our mindset around that, we're going to see radically different everything because it, it, it is now a more integrated, holistic worldview. Again, that shift in consciousness that allows you to see everything differently. And going back to the, the school or even the hospital metaphor is like no sane human would like put their child through school or through the hospital. I think from that worldview, they would see that as like wow. damaging to them. And, and damaging to the world. And they would say that that, that kind of gets the job done, but really screws them up in the process and, and we can do better. Definitely. So let me ask you this. What, this is just picking up off of what you said. What does, what kind of school would you want to put your children in? Wouldn't it be great if you learned about your different emotions as a child, as you were growing up. Oh my God, dude. Yes. Sign me up. I'll go back to school for this. <laughs> right. I mean, man, I think about a little G on the playground and he got, you know, he did not have a great time and no one told him what to do about that. Like no one said, Oh, you're feeling sad. You're not feeling part of the gang today. You're feeling left alone. Like, okay, this is how you be with loneliness. This is how you be with sadness. This is what these emotions about. Oh, you're feeling angry at so-and-so because, you know, they took the thing from you. This is how we do anger. This is the right way to be angry. And this is what anger is all about. Oh, you're feeling attracted to this, you know, pretty girl. Like this is, this is how you, you know, manage your sexual energy. Like that's okay. This is part of life. Like this is cool. Sex is great. This is what you do with sex. This is how you hold that energy inside yourself. This is how you communicate it about to other people. This is how you do it in a safe and healthy way. It's like, oh, you're starting to make some money on your side hustles and your lemonade stand. Like this is this is what this is how you manage your personal money. This is you know this is how you communicate to other human beings. This is how you care for a community. This is how you interact with you know the world around you. Like that that kind of education. Man, that that's what I'm. I, I love that man. I I really do love that and. So I feel like the, the the school would be more focused on here. Let's learn about the most important thing, you. Let's learn how to manage this. And I feel like that has so much to do with, um. Yeah, do you know who Sadhguru is? Yes, man, he's he's transformed my life. I went to go see him in person um, a couple of months ago. He taught me like a, a Kriya practice, and it's been very amazing. But I love the way he talks about like his school, and you know, it's it's folk. They teach dance. They teach. It's not like math. It's, it's not like that. It's you know, they teach dance. They teach singing. They teach, you know, like play and like you know, really it, letting their true intelligence shine. And um, so I really do. I, I like I like that approach. And um, 
we build that in our lifetime. I know where I'm sending our children. <laughs> I know I'm doing that. So awesome, man. Awesome. Now, um, another thing that I wanted to, um, you know, ask you is I like the, the idea that I was reading in your, in your book around that. What well, I forgot what it was called. Um, that visualization technique. Can you go ahead and like explain, explain to people what that technique is that way? Um, um, that way, like, you know, they can have something to take away from this and like something practical that they can do and how it's going to help them. Cause I like the way how you said, like from a third person view, visualizing you doing something. I like that a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, the first, the, the first part of this is, is that I feel like that, again, we talked about motivations for doing things, right? I think one of the, one of the things I, I do is I create connection and community wherever I go. It doesn't matter if I'm in high school, I'm, you know, bringing all my friends together to go to a ski trip or, you know, in college planning epic, huge parties with DJs and the whole nine yards. Right. Or, you know, later in life, like building organizations. And, you know, from my experience that comes if, like anything sort of like a, a true passion can oftentimes be related to a really painful moment. And I, I share with you of like what it was like to be a kid and be ostracized and left alone. And so the, the visualization that I like to guide people through is to have people like really slow down, close their eyes, take a deep breath and, and think about, you know, what were some of the most painful moments in their lives and just really connect to, you know, what were those moments where you, where you just felt so hurt or so wrong or so bad and just allow those experiences to come up and really deeply connect with them. And then from that place, you know, also see how that's, you know, created some of your greatest strengths and gifts. As a result of those experiences, you learned a lot about how to avoid those situations. Again, you spent a lot of time and energy working really hard to make sure you never felt that way again. And as a result, you develop a lot of confidence and skill and mastery. And so therefore, you know, you, if you tap into that, that can fuel your entrepreneurial journey and, and really be your force. And that, and that is a much deeper come from and a much deeper and more powerful why to, you know, to, to create from. And, and then when we get into the creation stage, oftentimes, you know, we're in these guided visualizations where we're visualizing what our lives need to look like. What I like to guide people to do is just take a moment to connect to, you know, what is, and then I do this for magic, like every single week is to connect to, you know, what is emerging in the business. Like, what does the business look like in the next stage of the game? If you're a solopreneur, you know, what, yeah, what is that, what is that next, you know, what is that next, uh, that next level to get to? If you already have a thriving organization, what's, what, what's, what, what do you, what do you sense like spirit is calling for, uh, to emerge next? And if you, if you can really picture that in your mind's eye, like what, what that next step is, then you can tap into, well, what's the thing I need to do next in order to make that happen? And if you consistently do that, you'll find that you're, you're, you're living your life and driving your business from a completely different way. That's a soul powered business right there. It's not, it's not like, Oh, I, I set this sales goal. So now I'm going to make 30, you know, 30 sales calls and like bother people that don't, don't want to be talked to in order to like get my goal. Like that's one way to do entrepreneurship. And the other is to really feel in the heart and soul of it and almost let it be uh, like an artist painting a piece of uh, on a, on a canvas and really have it be a soul expression. That's, that's organically growing and emerging. Soul expression. That's beautiful. So what advice would you give to somebody who's listening right now and they, they want to step in and help create this civilization? You know, they want to change the world and create a more conscious and a more inclusive world, but they just don't know where to start. And, you know, so what, what, what advice would you give to that person who's listening to this right now? I would do the meditation that I just described because that's the first step. It's being connected to why are you here? You know, everyone can make a contribution to make the world a better place. Even if it's just cleaning for your family, you know, if you're putting love into that and creating a safe and, environment for your family that can make it a huge difference in the world it's less about doing it's more about being and connecting to your connecting to your you know why you're here 
and taking action on that, I believe, is what's going to make the world a better place. If you, if you I'm not sure if you know of Tom Chi, but he's a, a Google, ex Google executive that uh, is a rapid prototyping expert that helps create, you know, he creates autonomous cars and, and you know, is, is, is created Google Glass, all these amazing things. He said that the world really, the most constrained resource in the world right now is passionate people taking massive action on what they truly believe in. And he, I asked him on a, on a call, I said, Hey Tom, you know, what do you, you know, what do we do about people that don't believe in that or are kind of like putting policies in place from a government perspective that counteract, you know, what we're trying to create. He said, spend zero time trying to convince anyone else about what you're trying to do or spend zero time fighting other people. He said, go find the three to five other people that are also bonkers crazy about what you're passionate about and form a team with them and, and, and start taking action. And that's, what's going to change the world. Mm, I like that. So I feel like there, there's a lot of people out there who they're really like, I just see this a lot in the spiritual community. People are into spirituality, people who are into consciousness and stuff like that. And I know a few where they're, they're so being, that they don't do anything. Like, you know, they're so stuck in the B, which I, I mean, we're human beings. I believe it. You know, like I, I'm all I'm all about that. You know, we're not human doers, but like for me, it took me a while to really take action. I guess you could say I was always scared to take action. So what what would like what would you tell the person who's like the old me, who's just all about being but they just haven't got to the actual step that's going to make that manifestation happen. It's a great point. So I think that from most of my circle where I come from, people struggle more with the opposite. They're just taking way too much action. They're doing way too much and they're not being enough. But I, you know, there's the other side of the spectrum, like you mentioned, where if you're just, you can't just sit there and meditate all day, right? There's uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there's a balance. And I like to think about that in terms of yin and yang, right? There's, there's being in stillness and focusing on your way of being and magnetizing towards you. And then there's taking massive action, being, you know, focusing the energy and going for it. And there's a balance to it. And that's an art, you know, in certain stages of life. It's, a, it's actually appropriate to be super unbalanced and to deeply explore one territory. Wow. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's wrong or bad that, People are super on one side. You know, you got very Gary Vee over here and maybe Sat Guru over here, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so everyone needs to be on their own journey. So maybe at some point, you know, Gary Vee is going to, you know, start to find more balance and veer in a different direction. Or maybe he's even go more extreme until he hits that outer limit and he starts to seek balance again. And so I think that everyone is on a journey. And, there, and you're right, there are certain people that know it's time for them to step more into action and that there's some resistance or fear there. So I would encourage them to go through the visualization that I described and notice what comes up for you when you, when you think, even think about taking that action that came up in your visualization. Like what emotions do you, are you experiencing in your body? And, and can you make contact with that and give that some space and room to arise? Mm, I like that. That's like the meditation you took us through, I think, on uh, that, that call. So that was awesome. All right, man. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. I have one last thing that I really, I'm curious to really see what, um, what would come from you. So if you had, you know, 60 seconds to give one last, you know, little speech to the world or, you know, piece of your device and, you know, just let them know something and you had 60 seconds on the clock what would be your last message to the world? I would guide through someone. I would guide them through a meditation. I would yes. say, I would ask them, you know, what's your edge? Like what's most alive inside of you right now? Can you feel into that? And can you take action on it? Hmm. I love it, man. I love it. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. And um, again, I want to thank you. Like just the fact that I even have the honor to interview you, man, like um, you definitely have made an impact on me just by 
you know, being the kind of person you are, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I feel like the world needs more Garrett's all over the place and we need more magic agencies. And, um, I know that, you know, um, you're definitely going to move, you know, after reading that book, brother, I honestly, I was like, okay, this guy's definitely, I'm fully convinced that you're going to move mankind forward in some way. And, um, I'm here to do the same thing, man. And so it's beautiful to, you know, connect with you and, um, just get to know who you are, brother. So again, thank you so much for, um, taking the time out of your busy schedule to do this call with me and, you know, for everybody, because I feel like this was a conversation that a hundred percent it needed to be heard. And so, um, and like your uncle says, not every conversation has a potential to change. No, not, yeah, not every conversation would change someone's life. But each conversation has the potential to, right? And I definitely feel like this is one of those conversations. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, brother. Have yourself a good one. All right. Thanks. Man, now that was an amazing interview. I really do hope that you felt the exact same way. I hope that that was helpful for you and you 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 found some you found some golden nuggets in there. I know for a fact I did, especially being an entrepreneur hearing um if like if you're if you're like if you're if you're a spiritual point blank period, Gareth is definitely somebody you want to connect with. But if you are if you are an entrepreneur and you want to raise the collective the collective consciousness of the world and that's what your business is doing and that's what your company is striving for is to really raise the collective consciousness of the world then you definitely want to connect with gareth you can find him on facebook at gareth herman or you can also go and you can also um i recommend everybody check out his um check out his his website gareth her gareth herman.com he has a download to his free book right there you can go ahead and you can check out his ebook i recommend you check out his book it is a very short read you can read it in that you can read it in one day and it will like if you're an entrepreneur it will inspire you at massive levels and um if you want to if you want to like see how he can actually work with you and help your business grow and fulfill that mission you can go ahead and you can visit magic.agency go to connect with him there as well i'm gonna go ahead and i'll link all his um credentials below but yeah guys thank you so much again for joining another episode of the mind man podcast again i hope it was as valuable for you as it was for me so have yourself an absolutely beautiful rest of your day beautiful rest of your evening and i'll see you guys next week thank you